A lot of us in the room had a great time in the Bronx last week, and uh, I'm going to go back a little bit later, but I want to say to everyone who wasn't there last week, we were, who were, are saying, welcome to the Bronx anytime you want to go. We're, we're inviting you, so you feel invited. Everybody who wants to go, let's go. Uh, we also want to say thank you for your prayers and for the blessing it, it is to have a home church who's supporting full speed, just full speed support uh, of the mission there. So today I'm going to talk about a turning point in my life that uh, spanned several years, maybe even dec- decades, but it's, it has an odd uh, title. You are more than grasshoppers. Yeah, how about that one? So, uh, God's people in the they left Egypt. Moses was leading them. They're headed to the Promised Land. They have some problems the way, but they end up at Kadesh. Thirteen. I feel like I'm going in and out here with the mic. I don't know what to do about that. Uh, but uh, in number 19, they come to a place called Kadesh. Some spies in. The spies come back and say, we can't take that land. We can't take that land because we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. These guys had an identity problem. Well... <clears throat> So have I had an identity problem. I've asked the question, who am I? And often the answer was not really true, and it wasn't really good. But this story about me and this verse in Numbers 13 started in 1985. I had just uh, been relieved of my coaching duties at ACU. I'd become, I'd coached there for nine years I would become the assistant to the president, and Bill Teague, who was the president at that time, uh, asked me to direct, as one of my duties, uh, direct a one-week-long camp at ACU, summer camp for high school students called Kadish. And that year, we had the biggest group we've had, had had since then. We had 99 campers, and we had one week of camp. By uh, 2000, uh, camp had grown. We had seven weeks of camp. We had over 2,000 campers. Uh, God really blessed me there. But back to Kadesh. The camp was called Kadesh. I hated that name. And I hated the name because it's an event. It was a story about an event of losers. And so I'm thinking, I don't want to be named something uh, for losers so it didn't hit me well at the beginning. But uh, I'll get to that in a minute and why it, it changed. But my, my job was, uh, over time, I began to work with the camp. Uh, it became a full-time job eventually. I'd gone back to coaching again. I coached for five years after my first stint of nine years. And then I began full-time in the camp, uh, summer camp business, and I was teaching Bible at the same time. And uh, <clears throat> during that time, camp was like this. We had 200 campers a week uh, of high school students. We had other camps with other kids. 200 campers. Uh, they were divided up into 20 groups of 10 where we had small group Bible studies led by two volunteers who had received the curriculum earlier. And we had counselors, college students, who stayed with them at night. So this was kind of the deal. And one of the things I did was develop, help develop the curriculum. And it was during this curriculum development that really I became, the, it was the turning point for me. And uh, this is where we're not going to stay, right here, because you are more than grasshoppers. But I want you to think about the, what they said about themselves. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. And often I had seen myself And sometimes even today, if I listen to Satan's lies, I'll see myself as less than what God's created me to be. 
And so uh, it was in 1992 that we really came up with the curriculum that was the identity curriculum. And uh, we changed the name. We wanted to sound cooler than just Kadish because what is Kadish? So we tried to emphasize it was a life camp, whatever that meant. I had a couple of partners who were helping me with this. And so we came up with a four-year curriculum. And uh, the four-year curriculum was this. We self-image was one one year, and then identity would be the next year, hope the next year, grace the next year, and we just rotate and then do them again. And we did this for 16 years straight, and then we added a, a few other things. But it was a Bible-centered curriculum that uh, me and one other guy, mostly two other people, developed. And uh, we had speakers, a uh, typical day, we'd have three speakers different times of the day, worship with all of those. We'd have two small group Bible studies where a group of 10 high school kids with two volunteer leaders, and and then we'd have service projects in the afternoon, and then we would have some kind of what I'm going to call right now experiential learning exercises, which some of you might have uh, recognized or even called uh, at the time skits. Okay. (laughs) But I'm calling it an experiential learning exercise because what the skit was about, you know, we're going to study the book, you know, something in, you know, Luke 15. And then what we want you and your group of 10 people to do is come up and give a skit for kind of how that applies to your life. Right. And that's what we do. And it was fun and it was stupid, but it was fun and we learned stuff. And so I'm going to talk to you about this one week of this camp, the one called Identity. And uh, I'm going to talk kind of through the flow of the week and some of the main points and some of the Bible stories, uh, Bible texts that we studied. And it was a great, I was having a great time. I, my job was pretty much to uh, logistics, and we had a lot of logistics going on uh, with our service projects. We'd send 20 groups all over Abilene every afternoon, and that's a, that's a chore. Uh, and then we would have Bible studies in the morning where I was writing this curriculum with a couple other people. And then we'd have Bible studies in the evening. We'd have speakers and we'd tell them kind of what to do. And so this was a pretty big deal, consuming job, but always great reward. But still, as I began to write the curriculum, it began to hit me. And it was not just the Bible studies, even though that was really important. That was the most important was just the different places we studied the Bible, but it was also some of the activities that that we did. So I'm going to go through kind of the week of the identity camp and and kind of give you just a taste of what it was like, maybe, if I can tell it straight. So um, on Monday, um, we had, we, at the first guy would speak and he would speak about just in general, what is, what does it mean to have an identity? I always was confused by that. I, I would say, I have an ID card. If I ever get confused about my identity, I'll just look at my card and I'll say, oh, yeah, I'm Bob. So I know who I am. I don't need to ask the question, who am I? I know because my name is Bob and that's who I am. But well, as you know, we're talking about more than just what's your name. If I say what's your name, you know, that tells me a little bit about you, but very little, you know, or where you're from. Okay, that doesn't tell me a lot either. But uh, so we're talking about more than just your name and your major and where you're from and what your parents do, what's your high school, what you do in high school, you're in band or whatever. We're going deeper than that, of course. So one of the things we did on that first day, we would hand out what we called white robes. Now, they, they really weren't white robes. I had this staff of about 30 college students, and they had prepared all the white robes. You know, we're going to end up using uh, about, mm, well, 200 campers four times, about 1,000, because we're going to have some extras, you know, 1,000 robes. And what they were was uh, white sheets that we'd cut up to fit a person, and they put it over their head, and it had a front and a back, you know, just a hole for the head. You understand what I'm saying? Kind of like a poncho, right? And they were white, white sheets, and we, and, you know, teenagers... They would love to wear these. Not, (laughs) really. (laughs) But one of the points we're making was some people, their identity is wrapped up in what they wear. You know, what kind of shoes they wear, what kind of 
what kind of clothes they wear. So we're, instead of trying to impress everybody by, you know, you're wearing a certain kind of upscale shirt and your friend over here is poor and he's got uh, from Walmart a white t-shirt. So everybody's going to look the same. That's what we started out. And uh, we made a big deal about that. We could, you couldn't call them sheets. You had to, even though that's what they were, we had to call them robes. All right, you with me? And they did everything they did that day. And they did their Bible study. They ate lunch. You know, they did their service project. And now some of the service projects, we had to take the robes off because, you know, you go into a certain uh, place and people, you're wearing a white robe and they think you're crazy. And, you know, we pretty much were. But the Bible study focused on things like uh, the rich young ruler. His identity was he was good. According to his religious, you know, uh, ranking of the day, because he followed all the commands, and he was rich. And yet he had an identity problem because God wanted him to be more than that. And, and yet that was it for him. So we go in into this, what are you? Who are you? Am I what I own? Some people, that's their identity. Am I my job? Is that what your identity is? Is it just your job? Is it what you accomplish? You know, uh, how you're, you do, uh, are you going to leave some kind of legacy or something? Or some people, they, their identity was their past. Either their glory days of middle school, when they were cool, and then they got to high school and they weren't anymore. Uh, that's really, those glory days are more for people like us, you know, uh, older kind, kind of guys. But, but, but also... A lot of times your identity is wrapped up in your failure. And some people see themselves as the worst thing they've ever done. And they can't shake it, you know. And so this was, for some, that's their identity. So Monday we're going through Bible studies and talking about what, just what is an identity and how did I get one. And, and we're wearing those robes. And so, and then we'd go through the day, we'd do the Bible study, we'd do the service project in the afternoon, we'd do another Bible study, we'd have our skits time, and then we'd end up worshiping in the amphitheater and sing uh, and worship our hearts out. And that was the way we ended every day. By the way, the worship was probably the most important part, because as you know, even here, the, the words that are most stick with us are those words we've just sung. Right? And thank God uh, there's a lot of great things we've just sung. So then comes day two. And day two is about the lies of Satan. All day long, we're going to be talking about how Satan lies, how our enemy lies to us about our identity. And it's always trying to, to, to trade the truth for a lie. And we studied different scriptures, but mostly the idea is that. The, the biggest lie is when we trade our identity becomes something that's about us. And so, for instance, uh, I would say body image or how I look. That's a big deal for teenagers. I'm sure most of us who are past our teens don't have any problems about how we look now. That's not a problem for our identity for some, it was in, you know, my, my identity is wrapped up in my intelligence or my, uh, the idea of my potential. Or, and so I get the idea that either I'm good enough or not good enough or I can become good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not funny enough. And, and Satan is telling you because you don't fit in and you're not at the top then you're nothing. And so, again, the lies of Satan, the whole day was about those lies. And, and the main point that was going to be made in, on, the day, on Tuesday was that our spiritual enemies have been effective in their lies. And we bought into so many of Satan's lies about us and that <clears throat> to, the outcome of believing these lies is that we see ourselves as undeserving of love, undeserving of Especially God's love. Or on the other hand, the opposite of that would be that our pride, you know, either I feel terrible because I believe the lies or I'm built up, pumped up by pride because I believe the lies and I believe that I, and, and yet if I'm pumped up by pride, uh, I live with this constant pressure to prove myself. 
And so I'm constantly unsatisfied. And so we, we go through the day examining the lies of Satan. It's a very important day. And then we'd go to the amphitheater and we'd sing and worship our hearts out. And here's what happened to me. Year after year, I would write the curriculum. And the curriculum itself would pierce my heart. But then I would teach the curriculum to the teachers. You know, when you're teaching the teachers, you got to get a little deeper. And, and what happened to me is God's word went a little deeper into me. And so as I'm teaching the teachers, I'm creating the curriculum, I began to hear God speaking to me through his word that I had also believed Satan's lies. And it had affected so much of who I was and, and, and how I treated others and what I thought about myself. And, and where I was headed in my life was towards a period of depression. And yet I was battling it with this identity curriculum, really, that was eventually going to win out. So Wednesday comes, and after we hear the lies of Satan all day Tuesday, we kind of we come in kind of feeling beat up, you know. And, and then we talk about the truth. Well, the truth is that I'm a beloved child of God. And just for an example of what the Bible studies would be like, Wednesday we'd start out with uh, a Bible study from Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, Ephesians chapter 2 uh, starts like this. And this is how we, we said that we're going to introduce ourselves, okay, because we're talking about identity and we're coming to know these 10 people that are in our group. So it's like you guys over here on this side, Danny and all of this, his group will say, Danny and Cindy are the group leaders, and the rest of you are teenagers. Can you all imagine yourself back as teenagers? Okay. And so you've met together. You've been hanging out together. You've been in really intense community with each other for two and a half days. And now you're coming to this Bible study we're going to do in, on Ephesians. And Ephesians 2 starts out like this. So I'd say, okay, we're, this is exactly how we'd go. I'd say, uh, first of all, we'd sit in a circle and I would say, everybody would have to do this. You'd have to describe a time. Okay, think about this. And Jessica, you're first. And, and then Betty, you're next. And Zeus is going to go around the room. Uh, describe a time when you received a gift or some kind of kind action that you didn't deserve. And the more over the top the gift or kind action, the better. Okay, so then you would have to do that, right? So you're going to describe a gift or something that you didn't deserve. And uh, this is never more true, I would, we would say, after everybody did that, this is never more true than our relationship with God. You're going to receive a gift you didn't deserve. And then, uh, we're getting ready to get into the core of the Bible. So, it says, so now read Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Now remember, they've already had two days of knowing each other, you guys. And we've studied about what is identity, and then we've talked about the lies of Satan, right? And that's what you guys know each other about so far. And so here's what Ephesians 2, verse 1, and 2, 3, 1, 2, and 3 say. As for you, now I'm going to take this personal. As for you, Bob, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient, and all of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying, we were gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So then I would ask the two group leaders, okay, that'd be Danny and Cindy in this case, uh, to, to reintroduce themselves to the group based on that scripture, this is your identity scripture. So I would, this is how I would have done it, okay? So this is Bob speaking to, now I'm doing this on a Tuesday night about midnight and I'm talking to a group of 40 volunteer leaders like Danny and Cindy and they're going to go into their group the next day, their group of 10, and they're going to do what I'm just teaching them. And here's what I would say. This is how I would have done that. Hi, my name is Bob, and I'm dead. Remember, I'm basing this off of Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 3. I know it seems that I'm alive, but inside I'm dead. You probably think I'm a pretty good person, 
But it was my sin that killed me, and I'm really a sinner. I fought it, but I always lost. And if you really knew all the crap I've done, you would be disgusted. I know that because I'm disgusted with myself. Somehow, I got caught up in a worldly way of thinking and acting. I seemed normal because everyone around me was living pretty much the same way. Some, like me, call themselves Christians, but we were really just like everybody else. Selfish, prideful, lustful, deceitful. I'm a liar, really, but I'm a pretty good one. I basically did whatever I wanted or whatever I, uh, I did. <clears throat> basically, I did whatever I wanted to or needed to in order to make myself feel good. I wanted to be happy, and I would do whatever it took to make me feel that way. I'd do whatever, whatever it took. And that's why I'm even here at this camp, because I feel better about all my crap if I take a week off and do something spiritual, go, like go on a mission trip. That helps my conscience. But really, I'm no better than the most hideous, filthy, nasty person you know. So, now you tell me who you are. Because we're all going to define ourselves based on Ephesians 2, 1, 2, and 3. And and here, as, as you do this with a group of high school kids and leaders, they begin to really begin to share what's real. Their masks become, begin to come off. And, and then the next question in the curriculum says this, until we can be real about our identity as a, a sinner, God's grace is only a concept. I want you to hear that personally. Hear this. If you can't be real about your identity as a sinner, then God's grace is only a concept, not a life-changing reality. And so... I'm digging into this, trying to prepare people like Danny and Cindy to to teach this and and experience this with high school kids. And the impact that it's having most, though, is on me. That I see, who am I? Am I what Satan tells me I am? Am I what the world tells me I am? Am I who who am I? And, And can I really hear the truth in God's word about Myself, And so later that day, we would also then have a Bible study about John 3.16, about how God loves us so much. And, and the truth of the Bible in 1 John 3 and 4 and how we are children of God. And, and so ultimately, we come how Tuesday is a day of what Satan's lies are. Wednesday is a day of God's truth. Because the verse that's right after those first three verses of Ephesians, the next verse says, But God. But God, who is, because of his great love for us, he's rich in mercy. He made us alive together with Christ. So this is the truth, that we are loved by God. And you know, some kids begin to believe that, and some of them aren't. And some of the leaders, they're beginning to believe, yes, God loves me in spite of the fact that I'm a sinner. God loves me. It's true. And I'm beginning to think this, as I'm the creator of the this curriculum, I'm, I'm also beginning to think. And year after year, I'm writing and I'm thinking of new experiences we can do. What can we do besides skits? Well, nothing. But really, yes, there is. And so we, we're just making our way through. And so the Thursday is the day we're going to call the battle to believe the truth. Because if Satan has lies and we understand that and, and God has truth and we understand that, well, how can I believe the truth instead of the lies? Because so much of the time, every day, what's reinforced in my life and by everything going around me is lies about who I am, that I am how much money I have, that I am what my GPA is, that I am if I'm, uh, you know, first chair in band or whatever it is. Those are the lies. Well, the truth is, no, God loves you. Yeah, I know, but I'm a sinner and I've lied and I've done so many bad things. One time I smoked a cigarette, you know, I yesterday I cussed or whatever bad things it is for you, you know. And, and the truth is, God loves you anyway. But how can I believe that truth? This is where we are. So this is where we are with the kids. And so Thursday, we have a Bible study about the mind and about Romans 12, that we're going to tra- be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Or 2 Corinthians 10, that we're going to take every thought captive. Or Ephesians uh, 4, where it says that 
we have a new attitude of mind. And we're going to put on a new self. And we're thinking about these things. So, well, then in the afternoon, and this is where we're headed. In the afternoon, instead of doing a service project on this day, we go out and we begin, to, we have the kids journal. And, of course, the leaders, you know, I'm not, Cindy and Danny aren't going to ask their group who's sitting around them to do anything that they're not going to do themselves. And so they're journaling. And they're, what are their journaling is the, the lies that they have believed over their lifetime that have created their identity. And it, and it could have been some of the things that are good about them. Like you are a, this is your identity, football player. And for me, that was it, man. And I was good as long as I was good. And then I got to a level of competition where I wasn't good anymore. You know, I was still the same good, but I thought, but the coaches thought I wasn't because I was playing a lot better people. You understand what I'm saying there? And this happens all the time. You know, all of a sudden now I'm not that all that. Any- so is, I, is my identity in football? Uh-oh. If it is. Or if it's being a good boy, oh, I'm not a good boy, so, uh-oh, what, what is my, so the kids would journal both things that are good and bad about themselves that they had believed was their identity, but their identity is not that. It's something bigger and better and more substantive than that. It's more, it's more reliable than the things they do or the, or the, the group they hang out with, and so it's better and deeper than the clothes they wear or the music they listen to. And so they're journaling about that. And then we come and we eat, we hear a speaker speak, and then they go to their group. And this time in their group, instead of a Bible study, they, they're given their, back their white robe. And I'm going to just pretend that Danny's, uh, what he's wearing there, that little blanket, is a robe. <laughs> and it's white instead of green. And so everybody got one of these on Monday. Remember? And they wrote their name on it, by the way. They wrote their name on the corner down in the bottom. And and now they're sitting in a classroom, and Danny's directing them in this exercise. And they they pass the robes back out, and they have their robe. And then they have that journaling about the lies that they did in the afternoon. And, And so what we ask them to do is they write all those lies on their robe. And a lot of the things they've written are, are some of the things they believe they, their identity is wrapped up in the th- worst thing they've ever done. And so a lot of their identity is shame-oriented. And maybe you've been there too, where guilt and shame has shaped how you think about yourself and about your relationships. And, and sometimes it's failures, and sometimes, or sometimes it's wounds that other people have done to you, things other people called you, names they called you, or, or times when you were rejected. And so all this junk, they're writing it on this robe, on the front and the back. And so they don't know what's going on next, but Danny and Cindy do because they're the leaders and I've told them. But they gather all their people up and they get in a van and we get formed this caravan, 20 vans, 20 groups, 200 kids, 40 group leaders. And we go out to this pasture out in near Clyde. And in the pasture, we walk and everybody's wearing these robes. And what's going to happen? These kids, they don't have any idea. And what's going to happen? And what happens is they line up in their groups and there's this big pile of wooden crosses. And what are they going to do with those? And the next thing you know, they, they notice... Because we begin to say things about the things that are written on their robes. And man, they wish they had not written that. You know what I'm saying? There's some things now they think, I wish I hadn't written that on my robe. And a voice, usually not me, but somebody, sometimes it was me, would say group one. And that'd be Danny's group. Pick up your cross. And Danny and Cindy would help his people pick their cross up and they would carry it. And they would lead them kind of up this hill. And now they're, they're really kind of disgusted with their robe and what's all on it. And they get to the top and they put their cross down and they take their robe off. And they're instructed by Danny and Cindy just very quietly. Take your robe off and 
they, they're handed a hammer and a nail, and they hammer that robe to that cross. And then they put the cross up, and then group two is coming right behind them, and group three. And pretty soon what we have is this hill of 20 crosses, and each cross has hanging from it <clears throat> 10 robes with a bunch of lies and junk written on it. And what we have done symbolically is we have taken this robe and the lies it represents and given it to God and nailed it to a cross. And in that act, there is a sense of freedom. Can you imagine this? Just imagine with me this great freedom. From the lies, from the junk, from the mistakes, from the bad decisions. Like, okay, God has taken those. And just like it says in Ephesians 2, because of his great love for us, God made us all. He's taken all that junk, everything that we used to think about ourselves. It's gone. We get back on the vans. We drive back to ACU at the amphitheater. We worship. And then Friday comes. And man, the the, the atmosphere has changed. It's really, I mean, the excitement is good. It's like, I feel like a new person. So many people just wondering, saying, I feel like a new person. And then I speak. That's the day I speak. And I talk about this idea in, in Revelation 7 that John sees in this dream. And in Revelation 7, he sees this dream And the people are falling down. They're in heaven. They're falling down the throne, just like the song we sang earlier this morning. We're singing, holy, holy, holy. And we're in the throne room. And and John, one of the elders who's there, comes up to John. And in verse 13, he says, the elder says, ask John, these in white robes. Here's where we were Thursday. Yep. These in white robes, John, this is in Revelation 7. Who are they and where do they come from? So the elders asking John, who are these people? And and John says back to him, sir, you know. And he said, yes. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And I'm talking about the transformation that happens when you give your life to Jesus and He takes everything you've ever done and every thought and He washes it and it's clean and you are clean and you are a new person. You experience renewal and restoration and forgiveness. And your past is in the past and you're stepping now into a new life with God. Say all that. And I say, now, guys, boys and girls, except they're not boys and girls, you know, Now, we're going to go get back on your van, and we're going to go back out to that field where the crosses were. And they're freaking out because, you know, they don't want to ever see that robe again, right? that, that, That stood for everything was wrong in their life. And so they're freaking out about that. But it's just calm down. Just trust it. It's going to be okay. Don't talk. Don't talk. Get on the van. We're going to quietly drive. It's about a 10 minute drive. We do it. And as we drive up, you see on this hillside, 20 crosses with robes kind of flowing. That looks pretty cool when you're far away. But then as you get there, you know, what they're anticipating is seeing all these robes with all that crap still on there. They don't want to see that, but they get there and they, it's different. Because, of course, overnight, you know, it's a trick. What we've done is there's the marker we used Monday to put their name is permanent, but all the other markers aren't permanent. So during the night... Some of my special guys, special forces guys, had taken the cross down and, and meticulously on a little diagram, taken all the robes off, but said, okay, you know, Danny's robe was right there, and Kimberly's was here, and then Kevin's was here, and we take them, out, take them off and then go wash them, of course. And now they're all white with just their name at the bottom. Interestingly enough, some of them had to be washed more than once. (laughs) Symbolic, maybe, I don't know. But they get there and they take the cross down and they take this white robe. 
And how all of a sudden something that seemed kind of hokey, kind of like breaking a little piece of cracker off, seems kind of hokey. All of a sudden it becomes real. And they say, who am I? I'm a child of God. That's who I am because I believe the truth of who God says I am. And I don't believe the lies that God says that the world tells me that I am my worst mistake. That my worst moment of life, now it's going to define me forever. Or, or that my, my, bad, my, my bad habits, they're not my, who I am. I might have some bad habits, but God, by God's power and grace, are going to transform me. But I'm not my mistakes. I'm not my wounds. I'm bigger than any of my wounds, no matter what someone said about me in the past. Or something that someone has done to me in the past. That's not who I am. I'm not my worst mistake. I'm not my wound. I'm a child of God. That's who I am. And I don't look at myself and I'm not aggressive. So a couple of weeks after one of the camps we had, one of the youth ministers there sent me a, uh, sent me a postcard. And the postcard was like this. <clears throat> it says, you are bigger than a grasshopper. Numbers 13. God's people looked at themselves in, at Kadesh and saw, them, saw themselves as grasshoppers. But that's not who they were. They were conquerors. That's what they really were. They saw themselves as losers, but they weren't because they trusted God 40 years later. The same, the kids of that same group, they stepped in the Jordan River and the Jordan River became dry land. They walked across the bed of the Jordan River and everyone in that country that they thought saw them as grasshoppers, all of the people were afraid of these people. They were afraid of them. Because they had heard how great their God was. And that's who we are. And that's how we sent them home. Thinking, not only is your robe clean, but you are a warrior. You're a mighty warrior. You're victorious. You're not a grasshopper. So, by developing the curriculum and thinking of all the goofy stuff we did, God changed me. And, And... Especially in the area of identity, that God said, Bob, you're more than your family, which is good. I have a good family. You're more than Jerry and Patsy's son. But you're also more than your mistakes. You're more than your sin. You're more than the things you've done. You are my son. And I love you. And there's nothing greater than that than to be my son. That's who you are. And as I've developed that curriculum, God was developing in me my own true identity. And so we're going to sing the song because as often happens, the song puts it better than the sermon of who we are. We are more than grasshoppers. And the name of the camp, you know, I despised it for a while because it's about losers. <clears throat> but really, the name of the camp that I inherited was Kadesh, the turning point. They had reached a point in their lives and in their travel with God at Kadesh, and they turned the wrong way. <clears throat> That's not what I want to be. And God gives us all that opportunity right now. Choose. Who do you believe? Who do you think you are? Because a lot of how you're going to live your life is going to depend on who, how you answer that. Do you look like a grasshopper? Or are you a child of God? Mighty warrior. Prepared for what's next in your life. Well, over the years, it's made a big difference for me. And one of the things that's happened over the years is adults... They were kids at the time. They were high school kids at the time, but now they're adults. They'll come up to me in different settings and say this to me. I still have my robe. (laughs) I still have my robe. 
And someone will even show me their, their rope. You know, one of the things we got a little more finessed as the years went by, but still, some of those robes, they still have their robe because it's a symbol of a turning point in their life when they chose to believe what God said about them instead of what the enemy said about them. And they come to that point every day where you choose who do you believe. Who do you believe you are? Let's sing.